Okay. So hopefully uh, this is already working, the streaming. Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm Andrea and I'm part of the, the organization team of Deep Learning Sessions Lisboa. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of, of our team uh, for joining us in this, uh, what is our first online meetup. Uh, these are a bit of strange times and we have to adapt to these uh, circumstances. Um, and so we're, we're doing this meetup online and hopefully we can even um, reach out to, to more people and people that are outside of Lisbon, either because they live outside or uh, they are uh, dislocated because of this condition. Uh, so yeah, I want to thank you for that. And uh, so just to give you a brief explanation of how this meetup will go, uh, we will have around one hour of talk and then we will have around 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. So you can uh, already uh, put some of your questions on the YouTube chat that you'll see in the video. And we will be looking out for uh, possible questions to, to ask João, our speaker, uh, after he finishes his talk. Uh, so don't be shy and uh, go and, and write your, all your questions that you may have about this topic. And uh, we will uh, address your questions in the end. So uh, essentially, we will have Jean Pereira from Eindhoven University of Technology today. He will talk a bit about uh, anomaly detection and uh, especially how you can do this anomaly detection using variational autoencoders, which are a very uh, interesting uh, neural network architecture. So Jean, you can go ahead and start uh, sharing your screen. OK, so thank you, Andre. Okay. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks all for joining this event, and thanks also to the organizers for uh, the invitation and for setting up this online meeting. And uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about anomaly detection and how we can do anomaly detection using a special class of deep learning models called variational autoencoders. And my objective for today is that by the end of the presentation, uh, you will be convinced that these models are flexible enough to be applied in a wide variety of uh, scenarios and applications. But before we jump into anomaly detection and deep learning, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Juan Pereira, and uh, I'm currently a PDN data science trainee at the Eindhoven University of Technology. So I live uh, in, in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. And uh, before joining the program, I did my master's degree in electrical and computer engineering in Lisbon at IST. And uh, although I'm affiliated with Tiwi, I work at JATS. And uh, JATS, it's an academy entirely dedicated to data science that was founded by the Eindhoven University of Technology and also uh, by the Tilburg University. And together uh, they offer a wide variety of uh, degrees and programs in data science uh, at all levels. We closely collaborate with uh, external partners and we have now over 300 partnerships uh, with uh, companies, public entities and also governmental organizations. And in the picture, you can see Jazz building that is located in a, in a former convent in, in the city of Den Bosch in the, in the south of the Netherlands. And uh, uh, so now we can get started with the content itself. So I divided the presentation today in three parts. So in the first part, I will uh, explain the problem and uh, cover it at a more higher level. In the second part, I will go into uh, deep learning and variational autoencoders. And in the last part, I will explain some applications of these models and how they can be used to do anomaly detection. So if I'm going to talk about anomaly detection, the first thing it's important to, to, to tell is what is anomaly detection? And uh, oftentimes, uh, anomaly detection is all about uh, finding observations in data 
that do not follow the normal or expected behavior. And by normally, we typically mean uh, the predominant pattern of the data or the typical pattern of the data. And uh, uh, you see here some ducks and uh, these ducks kind of illustrate that, that whenever uh, we, uh, we have to solve an anomaly detection task, the first thing we need to, to define is what is an anomaly in our application. So you can think that here, maybe the anomaly is the duck with different color or the duck with different size or the duck that is looking backwards. And uh, this basically uh, remembers us that uh, the definition of anomaly is very much dependent on uh, our context and our use case. Anomaly detection is one of those uh, machine learning problems and tasks that has a broad scope of application. And uh, uh, here I list some common applications of anomaly detection. For instance, fault detection, when you want to detect uh, problems in industrial systems and machines, or fraud detection, when you want to detect uh, financial, economic, or tax fraud, cyber intrusion detection. This is also a problem that is increasingly becoming more important these days. And uh, lastly, video surveillance. So imagine you have a scene, a camera, and you want to detect abnormal behavior in, in that, uh, from those images. So all of these can be kind of framed as anomaly detection problems. So now at the more, in more formal terms, uh, Anomaly detection uh, can be framed in this way. So let's consider that we have here a bunch of data points and uh, the goal of anomaly detection is to assign to each of these data points an anomaly score and then eventually convert it into a class label, normal or anomalous. And this is what we are interested in doing in this, in this task. And there are two ways generally to kind of uh, tackle this problem. One of them is to look at anomaly detection as a supervised classification task, where we are interested in discriminating between uh, the normal or anomalous classes. And in this case, we are uh, modeling basically a conditional uh, probability of the classes given data. And uh, that's what we want to model. But on the other side, uh, if you uh, look at anomaly detection more as a density estimation task, that is a typically an unsupervised task, we can also try to model and learn, uh, build a model that will learn the probability distribution of the data. And then once we have that model, we can evaluate how likely a new data point is under the model learned and then use that value to compute an anomaly score and then eventually convert it into a class label. So these are two main uh, ways of defining anomaly detection. And we will see how these two ways can be kind of combined using a specific type of model. And as in other machine learning tasks, uh, anomaly detection also um, has lots of challenges. And uh, there are some challenges that are really specific of this problem, some others that are general to other machine learning problems. And the first one is the class imbalance. Oftentimes, uh, the anomalies are a very small percentage of the uh, data points that we have, so typically less than 10% or even lower, like 1%. So this will create an issue if we think on maybe training a classifier in a supervised way because our model will be biased to the normal class. So it will tend to uh, generate a lot of uh, false negatives. And this is an issue. Also, data label scarcity is a problem because uh, in the applications uh, in the real world, uh, we don't have a large annotated data sets. And uh, all the supervised models that we can think of uh, require those kind of data sets. So this kind of calls for other approaches that rely less on good labels. And lastly, the data dimension and size. And this is related with the curse of dimensionality. Oftentimes we cannot perform anomaly detection in the, in the space of inputs. 
because there are too many dimensions to consider. And typically we are interested in computing some sort of distance between the data points and uh, distances in high dimensions, they kind of concentrate. And this is, will uh, raise some issues. Also the size of the data. We, we need models that can scale to very large data sets. And data size is also something that we should bear in mind, especially uh, when we deal with a very practical application. On the other side, the data points that we have and between dimensions, they are not really independent and identically distributed as we assume in some uh, types of uh, models. They have kind of dependencies between them. And oftentimes the anomalies that we want to detect, they are not uh, point anomalies. They, they kind of have some context. And to capture this context, we should take care of uh, integrating the dependencies um, in our uh, model, of our data in our model. So for instance, imagine we are dealing with time series or uh, sentences, there are dependencies between uh, these observations, temporal dependencies. If we are dealing with images, we also have dependencies between the pixels in the image. So there are spatial dependencies. And in videos, we kind of have both temporal and spatial dependencies. Also, if you consider other kinds of data like non-Euclidean data types like graphs, we have relations and relational dependencies. And these dependencies are crucial to detect the anomalies that we are typically interested in. So we will see how we can take care of learning those dependencies and in an end-to-end -end manner. So this was the more higher level introduction to the problem. And now we are going to dive deep into variational autoencoders and deep learning. And this will be the, the longest uh, part of the talk. So the first thing we do in deep learning, whether we have a downstream task that is classification, regression, or anomaly detection in this case, is to learn a data representation. And this data representation, regardless of the data type, should comply or should have some characteristics. We want it to be uh, low dimensional, because in this way, if we have a low dimensional representation of our data, we can tackle the curse of dimensionality. On the other side, we want this representation to be structured and expressive. So in other words, we want a representation that tell us something about the data and about its properties. And later we will see how exactly uh, this can be. So overall, our anomaly detection strategy will basically uh, include two steps. The first step where we are going to model the learn the normal pattern of the data. And here as output, we will generate these representations. And a second stage where we will actually detect the anomalies and compute anomaly scores. And we will do so based on the representations learned and also on other things that the models will provide, as we will see. So now I'm going to introduce uh, the simplest version of the, the model that gives the name of the, of the talk today, that is called an autoencoder. In this model, we are interested in reconstructing the input data. So it's an unsupervised approach that doesn't require uh, label data to be trained. This model includes two blocks. A first block called the encoder, that is a function that maps the data into a low dimensional uh, space called the latent space, where these rep low dimensional representations will be living. And you can think that these low dimensional representations are kind of a summary of the data, and they can be so good that it can even allow to reconstruct the data. And this will be the job of the second part of the model called the decoder. The decoder will take the, the, the representations in the latent space and map them back into the input space, reconstructing the data. So the way we are going to train this model is uh, using a, typically a loss function that kind of measures the quality of the reconstructions. And the way we are going to parameterize these two functions, the encoder and decoder, is using a neural network. 
that we can train using backpropagation. So in recent years, and what I mentioned up to now was completely uh, deterministic. So there was no kind of stochasticity involved uh, in this model. If you give a data point to the autoencoder, it will generate the same output, even if you run uh, multiple times over the same data point. But in recent years, there, are been, there have been efforts in, of, in trying to combine um, ideas from deep learning with uh, Bayesian learning and inference. And these two fields kind of have a, a lot to benefit from each other. And uh, uh, basically what they, this try to do here in Bayesian deep learning is to combine the theory or that we have from probabilistic modeling and Bayesian inference with the scalability of deep learning and in generally the power of neural networks as function approximators. And this kind of combination between these two areas is kind of, uh, kind of appears in a special class of deep generative models called variational autoencoders. And that's what I'm going to, to explain now. And uh, here, if you look at the higher level, you can find it, this model similar to the autoencoder that I just presented. So here now uh, you see the same kind of representation. And in this model, uh, the, the whole idea is that we will have latent variables that will be basically these representations. So the variation autoencoder can be also seen as a latent variable model or a probabilistic graphical model that we know from, uh, from the Bayesian uh, statistics. So the whole idea is that we are now going to add a constraint on the code on the representations of the deterministic autoencoder. And this constraint will be basically saying that this code is a random variable that is generated or that is uh, distributed according to a prior distribution and uh, pitet of z that we can choose. And the typical choice is a standard normal. So a normal distribution with zero mean and unit variance. And here now our encoder, so the first part of the model, will be playing the role of uh, approximating a posterior distribution over these latent variables. And you can see, think, think on this posterior as kind of generating a, a summary of the data, of the input data. And let's take an example, for instance, consider that, that X is like an image of a scene, then, uh, these latent variables z, these representations, we will, will be modeling things like the objects in the image and their pose. And this is where now deep learning comes into play. We are going to parameterize this posterior, so the relation between the inputs and the latent variables using neural networks. And why is this interesting? It's because uh, the relation between this kind of information about the image, like the objects in the image and their pose, and the pixels in the input space can be highly complex and nonlinear. And neural networks are very strong, very good function approximators. They can model very uh, nonlinear relationships. So this is the whole idea about using deep learning uh, in this model. And then, we have also here a decoder, like in the deterministic autoencoder, that basically is parameterizing the likelihood of the data given these latent variables in the latent space. And this is also called a, a generative model because we have now a sampling process in the, in the model. So by taking samples from this latent space, uh, from this posterior distribution, we can actually feed them to the, through the decoder and generate new data. That's why this is a model that can be used for data augmentation, for instance. And these data, these data points, these new uh, data, they are kind of similar to the ones that were used to train the model because they kind of lie on the same manifold in the latent space. But we have here a complication. Now we have this sampling layer here that we didn't have in the deterministic autoencoder. And we want to train this model using backpropagation and compute uh, gradients. And uh, it's not obvious how to do that uh, 
with respect to uh, sampling operations uh, within the model. So in the original paper by King and Welling that proposed this model for the first time, they also solved this issue. So they proposed the river amortization trick that basically uh, uses an auxiliary variable epsilon and that is a standard normal sample that can be even sampled before training the model. And then they compute the, the, the representation, so the latent variables in this way. So here we assume that these representations are distributed according to a Gaussian, but you can also use other uh, parameterizations, other distributions. And for each of them, you can find a reparameterization tree. So compared to the original autoencoder, the whole idea is that now in the latent space, we will have data points that have uh, a mean, but also a standard deviation. And these are basically the parameters given by the, the posterior distribution, parameterized by our encoder neural network. And uh, now we are going into a more a technical part, so explaining in detail how this model works. And in this kind of generative models, like the variation autoencoder, we are interested in maximizing the likelihood of our uh, observed data. And we like to do that in latent variable models by integrating over the latent variables. By integrating, so by marginalizing out the latent variables from the joint probability distribution of the data and the latent variables. That can be decomposed in this way. So a prior distribution over Z that we can choose and a likelihood term. Unfortunately, we cannot do that directly because this uh, integral is very hard to solve. It's intractable. So we will have to find another way of kind of optimizing this model. And the way we are going to do that is by building a, a tractable lower bound on this data log likelihood using a technique called variational inference. And if you work uh, with this expression of the data log likelihood, we can arrive to these uh, three terms here that make the equality. And if you look to the term on the right, you can see that there is a KL divergence between Q, which is the approximation of our posterior that is given by the encoder neural network and the true posterior that we want to approximate. That is also intractable, by the way, because it includes the same sort of integral. But we know something about this term that is it's always non-negative because the KL divergence that is kind of a, a measure of dissimilarity between probability distributions is always non-negative. So it's zero uh, when two distributions are similar and it's something higher than zero when they are not uh, similar, but it's always on end. And you can think that the log of a number between zero and one here, the term on the left, the data log likelihood is negative. So for the sum to be positive, this actually leads us to uh, prove that the two terms on the right are a lower bound on the data log likelihood. And this is one way of looking into this uh, uh, optimization problem. But another way is that uh, by thinking on the term on the left, the data log likelihood as a kind of constant. And because you know that this term on the right is non-negative, then uh, for the sum uh, to be constant, by maximizing this lower bound, we are actually minimizing the divergence between the approximation of the posterior and the true posterior. And we don't really have to optimize this directly uh, because this term we cannot compute because it's intractable. But by optimizing this lower bound, we are actually uh, uh, moving towards that direction. And so this is the expression. This lower bound will be uh, our kind of training objective in the VAE. So the loss function of a variation autoencoder will be basically uh, minus this lower bound because we like to minimize things rather than uh, maximize. So uh, minus the elbow will be the loss function. And if you look now deep into this uh, lower bound, we can see that the first term is an expectation over uh, under an approximate posterior. 
so the approximation of our true posterior of log of p of x given z. And if you basically use a Gaussian to parameterize this probability distribution, you can arrive to a term that is proportional to minus the error between the input and the reconstruction mean. So by maximizing this lower bound, we are actually minimizing the reconstruction error of the model, like in the deterministic autoencoder. And the term on the right is basically a, a regularizer. It will penalize the approximations of the posterior that are far from the prior that we chose. And this is basically the, the objective of a variational autoencoder. And uh, as you can see, there are some similarities with the variational, the, the deterministic autoencoder. So I've been talking a lot about uh, encoders and decoders. But what kind of neural network do we use to parameterize these posteriors and these decoders? And the kind of function that we will use, kind of neural network, depends on the data and on the application that you are dealing with. So if you have data points that are kind of independent of each other or they don't have much dependency, you can use a fit forward neural network for the encoder and decoder. But if you are dealing with like time series or text, maybe you are interested in using uh, some sort of network that captures the temporal dependencies like a recurrent neural network. And if you are dealing with images, you can also use a convolutional neural network to parameterize these encoders and decoders. And even if you have a graph structured data, like transaction networks or um, social networks, you can use a graph convolutional networks for parameterizing these, these encoders and decoders. So this brings to the variational autoencoder a very flexible, very flexible ways of taking into account uh, the structure in the data. So a common issue in machine learning is how we we'll regularize these models and prevent overfitting to the training data. And I'm going to cover basically two strategies of regularization that are special and kind of very used in this kind of model. And the first is called a denoising criterion. And the idea here is that we are going to take our inputs X, our data, and add noise uh, to these inputs during training. And we are going to force this model to reconstruct, not the, the original input, but a noisy version of this input. And the idea is that uh, this makes the model generalized better and makes it also more robust to noise and to small variations in the, in the data, in the input X. And this was an idea that was proposed in 2008 for the deterministic autoencoder. And it was then extended to the variation autoencoder in 2015. So the loss function will be basically the reconstruction, but uh, uh, given the, the input, the noisy input, and the original uh, input then. During inference, you don't add noise, of course. And the other way of regularizing these models is using uh, uh, a sparse constraint. And the idea here is to, to make the, the representation latent variables in latent space uh, sparse, uh, because this also uh, contributes for uh, better generalization performance and to make the, the model more robust to noise. And one way we can do that is by adding a, a const, uh, another term in the loss that penalizes latent codes Z that are very at very high norm. So this is one way, but there are other ways of enforcing sparsity. And this is also, also a very uh, studied topic. So I've been talking a lot about uh, variation autoencoders and uh, learning data representations because that was kind of our first step in the, our anomaly detection strategy. So now we have the representations and also the reconstructions that are given by this model. So how can we detect based on that actually the anomalies? How can we compute anomaly scores based on those outputs? 
And I'm going to cover different detection strategies from now. And the detection strategy depends a lot on our data regime. So depending on uh, whether we have access to label data, so labeled anomalies, or we don't have access at all to label the uh, data, we are going to define our detection strategy. And I'm going to cover uh, different strategies uh, for each of these regimes. So the first one is the, also the simplest one is when we have labeled data. So when we have anomaly labels, in this case, you can use the variation autoencoder on, from the variation autoencoder only the first part, the encoder to extract the representations of the data. And then because you have labels, you can train a classifier in a supervised way from these representations to the class labels. And in the, this way, this will be basically a classification problem as in other uh, machine learning applications. But now, what if we don't have labels? This is a quite common and often uh, scenario in when we deal with real world applications. So how can we detect anomalies, but without labels? And in this case, it's, the strategy is a bit more complicated. The whole idea is that we are going to train a variation autoencoder on data that we assume that have mostly a normal pattern. And this is also very often the case because the percentage of anomalies is very small. And then the model will basically learn the normal pattern of the data. And then we are going to use two different strategies to actually detect the anomalies in an unsupervised way. The first method is based on the reconstructions that are given by the model. And the idea is that uh, because the model was trained on mostly normal data, when you have an, a normal uh, data point, then the reconstruction will be uh, worse. And we can use the quality of the reconstructions to compute anomaly scores. And the other idea is to use the representations in the latent space to compute anomaly scores. And the assumption here is that the anomalies are represented in a different way than the normal data points. And we can also do, use those for detection. So let's go to the first method based on the reconstructions given by the variation autoencoder. One way of computing anomaly scores is to use the reconstruction error given by the model. And this kind of error you could also compute in uh, deterministic autoencoders. So basically you can use, for instance, the mean squared error or the, uh, the norm, the L norm between the input and the reconstruction and use that reconstruction error as an anomaly score. So higher, the higher the reconstruction error, the lower, uh, the higher the anomaly score. And in this model, if you want to compute this metric, you need to take several samples from the latent space, so sample different latent uh, representations, and then kind of average the, the error overall. Another metric is to use a, a smarter kind of a smarter uh, value, which is based on the, the log likelihood of a data point given the representation. And why is this more smart? It's because here we are taking into account not only the reconstructed mean of the data given as output, but also a, a standard deviation of the reconstruction. And this has been shown to be important to detect the anomalies. And here, basically, because this is kind of a log likelihood, the higher this log likelihood, the, the lower will be uh, the anomaly score. So if an sample is very low likely, it means that the anomaly score uh, should be higher. So here, uh, it's the opposite as in the other metric. And the method two was basically uh, based on the representations given by the, the variation autoencoder in the latent space. So one way of detecting the anomalies uh, under this assumption that the anomalies are represented far from the normal sample is by using clustering. So we can run a, a clustering algorithm that is unsupervised on the latent representations. And uh, we will find two clusters, a larger one containing all the, all the normal samples and a smaller one that, is, that contains the normal, an abnormal sample. 
And in this way, the detection is fully unsupervised. The other way is by looking at the distances between the representations of the anomalous samples and the normal samples. And here, basically, uh, given a test data point, normal or anomalous, you can compute a, a subset of distances between that, that data point and a random sample of the others. And for the anomalous samples, because they are more far, and this distance in average or in median will be higher than for the normal samples. And we can use this as an anomaly score. So now I talked about the supervised case where we can train a classifier on label data and a fully unsupervised uh, methods that don't require labels to be uh, generated. So what if uh, we have a few labels but we don't have labels for all the data points. And this is kind of a very common scenario, actually. So typically we have some labels, but we don't have uh, for all the data points in our data sets. So how can we leverage those labels in this kind of model uh, in the detection part? One way of kind of uh, leveraging these labels is by first training the variation autoencoder on all the data labeled or and then labeled in an unsupervised way, and then take these representations and train a classifier only on the labeled examples. And in this way, we kind of do supervised learning with variation autoencoders, but this is the simplest way of doing so. There are other strategies that were proposed and this is the first that was proposed in the original paper that uh, kind of uh, proposed the, the variation autoencoder. There are other strategies that uh, make use of adversarial training and they integrate class information into latent variables themselves. And they, kind of, they are kind of smarter and they kind of don't disconnect the classification part from the unsupervised uh, training part. So there are other strategies to do that, but today uh, this was one that I wanted to, to point out. So this was basically the, an overview about variation autoencoders uh, as a model to learn representations of data. And then I'll, I described the different strategies that we can use for computing anomaly scores uh, in the detection phase. And now I will cover a, a set of applications that I hope will make clear how can we use these models in practice uh, when we deal with different data types. So in the beginning, uh, I mentioned that there are dependencies between the data points oftentimes. So I chose an example for each data type, one dealing with time series, another with images, another with uh, graph structured data. And I will cover these three with some detail. And the first was um, basically the result of my own work uh, while I did my master thesis uh, a few years ago at IST in Lisbon. And I dealt with two data sets of time series, one coming from um, um, solar PV production, so energy generation in, in, from solar panels. And Another one uh, that is publicly available uh, containing uh, electrocardiogram time series, where each sequence is basically an heartbeat. And both of them have seasonality. So in this case, uh, one day for the energy, because the sun rises and, and comes down one day, uh, once a day. So uh, it's seasonal with seasonal pattern of one day. And in the other one, the seasonality uh, is basically uh, given by each heartbeat. So the seasonal period is the interval of an heartbeat. And we wanted to detect the deviations from the normal pattern in this data. So we proposed a model that kind of combines everything that I covered today. And I will now briefly explain how, what are the blocks of this model. In this model we have, uh, that is based on a variation autoencoder, we give a sequence to the model, a time series, and we, wait, we want to reconstruct this sequence. So this is kind of the reconstruction uh, that we want to obtain from a VAE. 
And then we are going to regularize this model using uh, adding the noise to the input. And this is basically the denoising criterion that I mentioned. And then because we are dealing with sequences with the time series, we are going to capture the dependencies between the observations in the time series using the recurrent neural network. And we actually use two. So we use an LSTM uh, in one direction and then another LSTM in the other direction. And we kind of uh, concatenate the, the final hidden states of these two RNNs and generate a, a, a some sort of global representation for the input sequence. And it's from this uh, representation that we are going to derive the parameters of our posterior over the latent variables using also two fully connected layers in this case. And then we have here the sampling from the posterior and we feed those representations then to the decoder. In addition to this, there is something that I didn't cover all the tension that is designed especially for sequence data. And that kind of takes more, gives more importance and takes captures the context of the different observations in the sequence. And we also feed that to our decoder at each time step. And our decoder will be basically a mirror of the encoder, also a set of two LSTMs, one in each direction. And from each hidden state now, we are going to compute the reconstruction. So the mean and the, the kind of the standard deviation that here we parameterize using the Laplace distribution. And that's how it works. And uh, then we apply this to this model to, to the blue data sets. And we used uh, the strategies that I uh, just covered. And now I want to show you the results. So, but before we go into that also, um, for those of you that attended the previous sessions, you, all, you, deal, you look at problems and models that are uh, adjusted to uh, sequences, for instance, to sequences of words. And this model for some of you might be recalling some, something that you know from language problems that is called the sequence to sequence model with the tension mechanism uh, in, the, in the hidden states of encoder. So in this way, the variation autoencoder that I just presented kind of is analogous to a sequence to sequence model that we know for uh, language problems. And a very special one, it's a sequence to sequence model where the output sequence is equal to the, the input sequence. And this analogy is kind of very interesting. So now let's look at uh, the solar energy data set where we used a strategy for detection that is based on the reconstruction scores on the quality of the reconstructions. And here I show you the representations learned by the model. So the latent, latent representations projected in a 2D space using two techniques. And if you look to the PCA plot, you can see that there is some sort of cycle because um, the, the date is seasonal. So when I mentioned before that we want a representation that is structured and expressive, that tells us something about the data that we know, this is the kind of property that we want to see in, the, in, the rep, in these representations. And in this case, seasonality. And this was learned in a completely unsupervised way. And the sequences were shuffled during training. So the model kind of uh, learned the seasonal part of the data without being told of that directly. And if you look now to, into the representations for uh, different sorts of anomalies um, and deviations from the normal pattern, you can see that they are indeed here on the right represented in a different way than the normal samples represented in green. And on the left, you see two bars, one with the reconstruction error that I described and the other one with the, the the one that is based on the log likelihood. And you can see that whenever there are deviations from the normal pattern, there is an higher anomaly score. And this was basically the results on the first data set. And now, if you look at the second data set, that was the electrocardiogram data set, where each sequence is a data point in these two plots that are the same kind of representations in the latent space. 
we can see that uh, the normal samples here represented in green, they are represented together, while the anomalous uh, arc bits, they are far from the normal ones. And basically, this, is a, this was learned in a completely unsupervised way without giving any label to the model during training. And then now, if you look at those representations, we can think on using the second detection strategy that I described, the one that is based on the on clustering and uh, computing distances between the representations in the latent space. And that's what we did. And uh, we kind of showed that this uh, kind of approach using clustering and watch time distance kind of outperforms other models, including some supervised models by uh, some margin, a very small one, but still with a small improvement. And uh, again, this clustering strategy, for instance, it was completely uh, performed in a fully unsupervised fashion. And this is kind of uh, motivating us to develop further unsupervised models, unsupervised anomaly detection strategies that don't rely so much on the, on the labels. So this was the first example using time series that was based on my own work. And now uh, we are going to look into an example that I thought it would be interesting for some of you that are working with uh, medical images. And now we are uh, basically looking at uh, MRI images of the brain that uh, are very often used for detecting uh, brain lesions. Uh, we, if you have a trauma or an infection or cancer, uh, the medical doctors uh, would take these pictures of your brain and they want to detect lesions in those, from those pictures. And this is very important because uh, de detecting those lesions uh, in the early stage, it's crucial for prognostics and also for uh, improving the, the treatments. And in healthcare and in medical imaging, the lack of labels is really an issue because to get annotated images of, your, of the brains of the patients, you need to have uh, experts, medical doctors that will annotate those images. So they are very, these labels are very expensive and time consuming to obtain. So once again, it, this motivates that we kind of follow unsupervised strategies for detection. And here, let's take again a variation autoencoder here in a simplified um, architecture that takes in an image of the brain and is trained to reconstruct that image in the way I mentioned. And then we are going to compute an anomaly score that is just given by the pixel-wise reconstruction error. You take a pixel and its reconstruction. You compute, for instance, the absolute value and you use that as an anomaly score. And now I'm going to make use of results of this work, this recent work by Chen and Konohoglu, where they looked also at the same problem, detecting lesions from brain MRI images. And they applied a variation autoencoder as well as other types of autoencoders that make use of adversarial training. They also uh, employed a new, uh, detect a new regularization strategy that basically is making, in, enforcing consistency between uh, the representation of the original uh, image and the representation of the reconstruction. They assume that they should be similar. So they include this term in the loss to promote this uh, consistency. And here we can see the results that they obtained. On the left, you have uh, some images of, 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 of the brain and uh, um, on the third row, you have images that contain lesions. And you have here the lesions on the right, the ground through, uh, annotated. And here, the X tilt is basically the X at, sorry, it's basically uh, shows the reconstructions of the variation autoencoder. And you can see that these points here on, with white, they are not well reconstructed. So now we can compute the distance, the difference between the original image and the reconstruction and use this value as an anomaly score. And you can see that the, the, the errors, so the reconstruction error is much higher uh, in the lesions and they are kind of aligned with the, the ground truth. 
And I remember that they obtained this is a in a completely unsupervised way without making use of this ground through uh, lesions. And this is kind of uh, promising uh, and uh, um, tell us that we should continue improving further these kinds of methods because in healthcare, obtaining label data is very hard. So now I will show you another example using a completely different data type again. So we started with time series and then we looked at images. And now I want to uh, show one that is more conceptual. Uh, and also because these applications are more recent with uh, network graphs, when we have non-Euclidean data. So let's consider we have a graph that can be, for instance, a social network or a citation network or a transaction network. So let's take the last example as, an, as in our case. You have different clients of a bank that are performing transactions between, in, between them. So here the edges are the transactions. And maybe you also have some information about these clients or, um, or in the social network about the users of that social network. And you can encode this information in a feature vector for each, um, for each um, user or client. And then we can think on representing this graph using an agency matrix that includes all the connections and uh, encodes all the connections between the, the clients. And also a, a node feature matrix with the, node, the features of each client or uh, user. And then we can use the same kind of approach that I mentioned before. So we can encode this using some encoder network. In this case, the neural network optimized for a graph structured data, like a graph convolutional network that was proposed in 2016 by Thomas Kipf. And um, then you can obtain a representation of this graph. And based on this representation, again, have an encoder that will reconstruct in this work um, the agency matrix. And this whole idea of uh, variational autoencoding graphs was also proposed in 2016 by the same authors um, in this paper called Variational Graph Autoencoder. And you can use the same kind of strategies to then detect abnormal behavior in these graphs. For instance, the negative log likelihood of, the, um, of a data point. Um, and in this case, you can also use, for instance, the reconstruction error or using the agency matrix as an input. And uh, this was still uh, an unsupervised approach, but you can also use some labels to uh, better encode these uh, graph features. And in, this, in, this, in that way, you can do misprovised classification also. And uh, uh, Kip and Welling also have some works on that that I included in the references. So these were the three examples that I wanted to uh, tell you about. And now I have some take home messages that I want to, uh, to explain. The first one is that deep learning uh, is all about representation learning. And if you look at today's presentation, I spent quite some time explaining how we can learn representations of data that take the context and the structure into account uh, using uh, deep neural networks. And then um, you can think that uh, using these detection strategies, anomaly detection is a problem that is solved. But that's not the case. And, uh, if you look at uh, the results obtained using unsupervised anomaly detection uh, approaches, they, they still underperform in many cases the supervised ones. So there is still a lot of work to do uh, in trying to improve the performance of these strategies further, uh, both on the first part, so both on the representation learning part, and also uh, on proposing new detection strategies that um, uh, can give better performance and still rely uh, less on the label data. And then the other message is that variation autoencoders, as I mentioned in the beginning, I wanted to convince you today, are very flexible models. They can be applied to almost any kind of data. And you basically can choose a neural network that is suited to that data to parameterize the, the model. And they scale well to big data because Still, we are doing uh, inference uh, using neural networks. 
and we have very specialized hardware uh, where we can do this inference uh, very fast. And um, this scalability problem is very important in practical applications when we want to operationalize these models. And the last is that this model uh, tackles the class imbalance problem that I mentioned in the beginning. Because now, instead of discriminating between classes, we are interested in more modeling the normal class. So the less anomalies there are in the data, the better for us, because we kind of assume in this uh, strategy that the data has very, uh, very small percentage of anomalies. So now, uh, the whole point of the presentation was to say that um, anomaly detection and deep learning are an application and an approach to that application to that uh, to solve that problem that kind of combines very well and it has been very exciting to see in past years in these recent years uh, with the advent of and progress made in deep learning that we kind of are solving and solving uh, more issues in anomaly detection and these two uh, areas combine very well I also included a list of references uh, about the models, the strategies of detection and applications to different types or to different data types. And I also included the links. So you can give a look uh, further here uh, in, these, in these references. And I also included a link to my own works. Here, if you want to, uh, to look at the details. And uh, finally, uh, I also made this presentation available uh, in the link through, uh, that you can obtain through this QR code. And the organizers also uh, made the slides available in the GitHub repository of this meetup. I want to thank you all for joining today's meetup. And I hope that I can we can meet uh, in Lisbon in some future meetup, uh, deep learning meetup about some other topic. So thank you. So thank you very much, Juan, for your presentation. Uh, I think it was a very insightful view uh, of VAEs and especially applied to anomaly detection. Uh, so we have a couple of questions for you here. Okay. So essentially, Lucas, uh, Lucas Suarez starts by asking, uh, how does it compare? How do VAEs compare to GANs? So can it be applied also to anomaly detection and how? That's a very great question because both uh, variation autoencoders and GANs, they kind of fall in the same category of deep generative models. And that has a lot to do with um, the pros and cons of each of those models. And we can say that one of them, one is better than the others, because, but it depends a lot on our application. So typically variational autoencoders, they are, they are good at maximizing likelihood. That's what they do is to maximize the data likelihood. Uh, and uh, for those models, for VAEs, that is kind of a straightforward way of evaluating these models. Basically, you can use the, the log likelihood on a test data set as kind of a score, as a, as a metric. Whereas in GANs, um, it's not so obvious how to evaluate uh, and compare different GANs. And, and drawback of VAEs now, because there are advantages and disadvantages, is that VAEs they tend to generate um, blurred samples. So because we add noise in the latent space, the reconstructions, they are kind of blurry and that's not good. And GANs are much better uh, and they are very good in um, producing and generating realistic samples, new samples. And uh, the last thing uh, maybe also is that, uh, so generally GANs are much harder to train than autoencoders, than VAEs. So um, that's also something that can uh, matter. But the problems of training both, they have kind of an analog analogous uh, uh, issues. So if you may, might have heard about something called a posterior collapse in a VAE as an analogous problem in a GAN that is called the mode collapse. So I would say that, um, this depends, the application of each of those models and the performance depends a lot on your use case. But these are maybe the general advantages and disadvantages of each. And so in essence, um, you could also try to combine the two approaches, right? So for instance, if you have a, a semi-supervised uh, learning uh, scenario, you could use yeah. the encoder of the VAE and then 
apply uh, again to to do essentially the the decoding and classification part you can and in again you can also do a smith supervised learning so you can also use some labels that you add to model the the, the features that are uh, within the layers of the, the gun and uh, there has been some works on that there is a work called gun anomaly that kind of tries to do that and the, the results are very exciting and uh, this work has been done more recently and um, yeah, it's exciting to see, but still it's not broadly studied. And that's all what I also mentioned that normal detection is not solved. So we should keep trying to uh, use better models to do normally detection. Very well, exciting times. Uh, well, uh, besides the whole pandemic thing, but yeah, let's yeah. forget about that for a minute. <laughs> and yeah, so we have another question now from Ricardo Lopes. Uh, about can we use VAEs for interpretability? So essentially, can we extract any information that profiles or characterizes anomalies? Because we're not only interested in detecting an anomaly, but also interested in knowing which set of sensor data had the most impact on each anomaly. Yeah, so definitely it's a very a good question and there's a lot of importance for practical applications that require explainability. And uh, um, I would say we are st still not very good at uh, interpreting these kind of models. But one way that I've seen that can be used is by when you have a Smith provide strategy, like a, a classifier that is trained on these representations. And uh, if you use what is called an attention mechanism over, for instance, the encoder hidden states, if you are dealing with time series, so as I showed here. Uh, if you are training in a supervised way in, on some labels, uh, a classifier on top of those representations that are generated using also an attention mechanism, uh, you can look at the attention weights and see the probability distribution over the hidden states of the, the input time series and, and kind of uh, interpret which observations in the time series contributed the most for those labels. But still, that I would say that is only applicable when you have some labels of the data at least. And it's not really like causality. You cannot tell that this observation caused that label, but it kind of helps uh, interpreting uh, a bit. But I would then say that more than that, I think it's still a black box. I think. Hmm. Yeah. But uh, also out of curiosity, because uh, even in the unsupervised scenario, you also have this method of using the reconstruction probability, right? Yeah. So in essence, you could perhaps try, because there are some interpretability methods that yeah. work with the, with the probability, with the final uh, output, yeah. let's say. So yeah. you could try so, also perhaps to, to interpret through that. Yeah, so you can use the, the, the variance in the output, uh, the variance of uh, reconstruction to compute uncertainty, and then that can help in interpretability. So computing, not only giving a score, but saying uh, like having a measure of uncertainty. You can definitely do that. Yeah, and uh, uh, I would say if you look at Bayesian neural networks, that's exactly what they do. And um, because now we have a variance on the representations and on the reconstructions, you can compute uncertainty. Yeah. Maybe that's what uh, 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 our viewer asked maybe about interpretability was more related with like uh, tackling uncertainty and uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so we have a question from Sebastian Perez, uh, which asks, um, so essentially the latent space of a VAE uh, is continuous. Uh, and this question is, how do you apply clustering given this constraint? So essentially what kind of clustering method do you use on your method? Yeah. So nothing special. So the, the idea is that you use the encoder to extract the representations. And then you, learn, you run uh, the clustering algorithm, algorithm on the posterior means. So we take the means, posterior representations, and we learn, we, we perform clustering using uh, k-means and spectral clustering and the most common algorithms. But uh, yeah, it's not included in the loss function. So it's not optimized together but it's used on over the posterior means. Yeah. I recently received the contact where they kind of tried also to include the, the variances of the posterior and use that in the clustering. 
And I think they, they are trying that, but uh, we didn't explore that in our work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Ricardo Lopes about can we use VAEs for predicting anomalies rather than classifying them? So the desired output would be oh. something like life expectancy number rather than alive or dead classification. So I'm guessing if you could use it somehow for regression. Uh, you, I mean, you mean um, to detect anomalies in advance? Or like, um, yeah, can you repeat the question exactly what was uh, written? Yeah, so can we use VAEs for predicting anomalies rather than classifying them? And then uh, Ricardo also mentions here like an example of essentially applying it to a regression, like life expectancy number, uh, instead of just a pure classification of alive or dead. Yeah, so I would say that there you would have to have an, a separate network that uh, receives as input the representations from the model and does the regression for you are interested in. So I don't know, maybe you are interested in computing things like uh, RUL and uh, uh, this kind of metrics. And uh, yeah, I, I didn't think too much about it. I didn't work with that, but uh, I would say that you can always use a VAE as a method to extract data representations and then train your other models uh, on uh, those representations. So yeah. But in detail, I, I'm not aware of the application exactly. OK. And uh, from Leonardo Nuleto, we have, so on huge data sets, uh, when do you train uh, a VA model? Do you feed them uh, the entire data set, or can you do some kind of uh, subsampling? I'm guessing the subsampling will always be worse results, right? So you mean the old data set, like all the data points, or? Um, yeah. Uh, or, you, or you, you suggest like um, training it on just a, a, a small part of the, the data or? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's my understanding at least. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, in the end it will all uh, come with uh, evaluation metrics, but I would say that of course, if you use less data, the model will uh, approximate less accurately the probability distribution of the data and then the scores will be also not so good, but um, yeah, yeah, the whole idea is that you need to have a good approximation for um, uh, so the, the probability distribution of the data and your data points should be uh, representative. So uh, yeah, yeah, it depends, it depends, I would say. Yeah, so basically as always with the uh, deep learning, uh, more data is usually better. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, okay. Sometimes. Yeah, if it's at least well represented, like you said. Um, so yeah, do, do you also need some kind of threshold or parameters to detect the anomalies? For instance, when you do this kind of clustering approaches? Yeah, that's also a very, a very good question. So um, in the detection strategy that I mentioned, so the one based on clustering, in that one, you don't need at all uh, to do use uh, some threshold on the score because you will end up with cluster data points assigned to each cluster. And you don't even need a label to choose the, the cluster label because you know that the bigger one will be corresponded to the normal class. And you can assign the, clus the cluster labels in that way. Uh, in the other metric that I also mentioned, based on the distances, yeah, at some point you need to put a threshold on that. And also, uh, in the reconstruction error, um, you could think that you might need to define a threshold somehow. And that, from my experience, can be done in three ways. So in the, for the simplest one that is also maybe the more straightforward, but also the one that is less, probably less easy to do, is if you have some labels, you can learn the threshold that basically optimizes the classification that you have. And uh, that would be a way to solve the problem. But you still need labels. And the other two ways are more like related with the exact uh, use cases in the companies that uh, people uh, have. So imagine that you are in a company and uh, you want to monitor some KPIs from some uh, machine. And the idea is that even if you learn a threshold with labels, that could generate a lot of anomalies to look at. 
And what can be done instead is that you basically tell the system to give you the top, for instance, 100 anomalies, the top 100 anomaly scores, the ones that are more severe and that you really have to look at. And in that way, if you define like the, um, this kind of uh, number or anomalies, you can adjust the threshold so as to generate those anomalies. And more recently, I also thought about another way. Think, um, so yeah, so if you are in a very spe specialized field, sometimes the experts from the company or from the domain, they have an idea about what is the percentage of anomalies that is typically common. So for instance, you can have an expert that tell you um, in this domain, in this problem, we typically have 1% of anomalies. And in that way, you can also uh, find the threshold that gives you that uh, percentage. So I would say these are three ways to uh, find th that threshold. But uh, yeah, the more straightforward one requires labels, whereas the other two are more like practical use cases. Very well. Uh, I was also a bit curious here uh, because we've been talking about this, this method being very flexible, being applicable to sequences, being applicable to images and uh, even graphs. Um, I was curious if you have some, some information, some knowledge, if this can be applied to uh, multimodal scenarios. So for instance, if you have a uh, data set that contains both uh, tabular data, for instance, images and other sorts of uh, different uh, contexts. Yeah, and that's also a very uh, practical case. So sometimes we, we not only have like, uh, for instance, one uh, modality we have for instance, time series and images and text, and we want to combine all of that uh, in our system. Yeah, um, I didn't work in that uh, exactly in that uh, use case, but I would say that uh, in that case, we would have to, um, to use different encoders, one for each uh, data type, and then kind of merge and combine the representations kind of concatenate them in a single uh, in a single representation, and in that way you can still I think train end to end, so to optimize the model. And you would have to have different encoders, one for each uh, data type. That's what I was thinking, and um, yeah, I think I saw one or two works uh, focusing on multimodality using uh, VAEs applied to uh, time series and. Uh, yeah, I think I have one in the references, yeah. So I think well. the search, yeah, it was applied to robot assisted feeding. So, and it, it's also multimodal and they want to integrate to do fusion, sensor fusion, and then to detect anomalies using a, a variation auto -encoding. Yeah, this is very exciting. Uh, so thank you again, Joan, for your talk. Um, yeah. I think we can all agree that it was uh, very interesting. Um, so I'd also like to thank uh, all of our viewers and uh, especially since this is our first online meetup uh, and yeah, this is, we are still experimenting with this. Uh, but so we would like to, to ask you to, to also check our description of this video uh, where we have a feedback form where you can also tell us what you thought about this meetup and how we can improve for, for further uh, events. Uh, we also have a, an interesting form for a speaker application. So if you're interested in also presenting in a meetup, you can apply through that form. And yeah, you can, you will then have all the, the content and the slides available on the links in the description. We have it, the, the slides on our GitHub page as well. And uh, yeah, it's just a matter of uh, thanking you all again for participating in this community and hope to see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you also for the invitation. Yeah, and see you all. Bye. Stay thank safe. Thank you, John. Bye. <laughs> Bye.